Welcome to the Protectors Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Piccolo. Had a great guest on the Protectors tonight, Thomas Pecora. Thomas spent 24 years in the CIA, and he's got a ton of great stories. Now, one organization that is near to him, and that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, is the CIA Officers Memorial Foundation. That is our shout-out tonight from the Protectors. The CIA Officers Memorial Foundation supports the well-being and educational needs of children and spouses of all fallen CIA officers. So on behalf of the protectors, I'm going to donate $50 to the CIA Officers Memorial Foundation. Now, if you match my donation, just send me an email, and I will gladly give you a protector's hat and a special protector's bottle breacher. So reach out, and please support them. Thank you. Got a special podcast tonight with Thomas Pecora. You know, a lot of times our our agency personnel live in the shadows. Uh, Thomas is out of the shadows now, and he's just got done with his book, "Life in the Crosshairs of the CIA's War on Terror: The Guardian." Is that is that correct? Yeah, it's Guardian: Life in the Crosshairs. Yes, it looks really good, and I'm actually going to order this tonight. Now, I notice you could order it everywhere too, which is really cool. Yes. Awesome. So Thomas, I went through your bio real quick. You know, I was looking back and the first thing that popped to my mind was you're a CIA protective officer and you, the Black Hawk down, bam, right there. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? I mean, were you, how do you get into that, that world? That's a, that's a great question. Um, the, the book is the origin story behind, um, the, the, the protective operations unit. Uh, that was later exposed uh, in Benghazi. Uh, I was actually in the first official training class, and that was in 1991. And um, uh, we were trained specifically to provide protection for our case officers uh, going out to, um, to collect information in areas that were just too dangerous for them to operate on their own. So uh, fast forward to... Uh, uh, basically the Black Hawk Down situation in Somalia, what we had happen is the uh, U.S. military went in and were, uh, it's a humanitarian effort in, in Mogadishu, and our people were working to, um, to get information for them and uh, for people back in Washington. So we were, um, we had to get out there and, and uh, provide protection for our case officers, and they were moving around, and basically what I call Mad Max. It was, uh, it was about as lawless as you can get. And now, uh, but, now this brings us back to like this is this is way pre nine eleven, and where the case officers were more like the the spies of the 007. You know, not really the 007, but kind of doing the circuit and working the embassies and stuff. Was this kind of like a new thing for them too to have you guys like, hey, you know what, we got these armed guys and absolutely, and, absolutely. It, it, it took a lot of adjustment because they're they're used to operating alone. They're uh, used to operating in very uh, basically environments that that they can blend in. Here, they're not blending in, and um, uh, the level of, of threat was just so high. So we had to work. Uh, that was one of the unusual things about the unit. We were uh, we were tasked with doing clandestine protection, uh, a low profile. So we wanted to move around the cities in ways that people wouldn't realize we were there. Uh, one of our mantras is, if you can't see us, you can't shoot us. That's perfect. Now, let's backtrack even farther. How does someone, I mean, were you prior military or were you? No, no, I, I came and I was a, I was coaching wrestling after uh, <laughs> getting my master's degree in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And I answered an ad in the newspaper. And they said, oh, okay. That's, that's random. <laughs> yes. It, I mean, it's it's pretty crazy story. and uh, And then I ended up getting it in 1989 and I, I was put in as a, a in the security generalist uh, position which is um, they, we have a uniform division then we have a generalist division basically and, and which they call now the multi-discipline security officer because we because we uh, we work in a variety of different areas like personnel security 
um, protective security, uh, computer security, um, physical security. Um, so I ended up um, uh, getting in there. I, my first job was doing background investigations. And uh, while I was doing that, I saw that they opened up um, a, a training course for this new unit called the Protective Operations Cadre. Huh. And, you know, I, I, I keep trying to remember to, and to inform people who are millennials <laughs> in that age group that <laughs> back in the day we had to use newspapers and write letters and it wasn't and things didn't happen overnight. So I can imagine like it's just random that out in Wisconsin there's an ad in the paper for, hey, you know what? And it was probably like, hey, call the recruitment center or something like that. It, it was strange. And then a couple, uh, I, you know, I, I put an application in. A couple of months later, I get a phone call, and uh, at first, I thought one of my buddies pulling a prank on me, and I, I, I didn't take him serious. And then I'm like, "Oh, okay." So I, I went down and met him in a hotel room, and um, talked about my background. And then, then I ended up going it, um, uh, taking a trip to Washington D.C. where uh, extensive vetting, polygraph, the whole nine yards. And then I ended up in uh, September fifth, uh, nineteen eighty nine which is also uh, just a date that I'll never forget because that was also the date we got hit uh, moving around in, in Mogadishu. Oh, wow. Now, how do you go? Um, you know, that's one of the things like, so you're a college guy. You're not a military. You're not an SF guy. You're not a SEAL. How do you get into the whole, like, do they send you to like, I mean, I'm, obviously you probably can't talk about some of the training, but can you talk about any of the training? Oh, absolutely. Uh, in fact, in the book, the book has got never before disclosed information about this, um, this unit, uh, how we operate. Uh, it's, it's all brand new. And um, it, it, it's totally different than working in a military unit or a police element because we were trained to do low profile clandestine operations in, in the foreign environments. So we, we were using tradecraft principles that the case officers were using, the spies. We, we used um, training principles that came from DEA, their undercover agents. We worked extensively with Secret Service to, to get the, the, the core theory for protection. And, uh, and then we worked with, uh, with other elements that do high-speed training and driving surveillance work, uh, weapons handling. So it's a it's a different uh, a, a very different animal than uh, typical uh, military type training. Now, were you in? I mean, obviously you were in good shape. But like, what would you equate the security officer to? Like, you know, the SF world or the military world or, or anything? Like uh, that? Well, the, the standard security officer really wasn't uh, at the agency. Doesn't do this kind of work. It's a very unique small set that go into a, this protection size, specifically this overseas protection unit. We have another unit, the director's protective staff. They've been around a long time and that's, that's more your traditional protection. Um, and uh, that's mostly domestic and um, that's a different element. Uh, but what we did was uh, a lot more fiscal. I mean, you, you had to be ready to take, um, uh, take care of the principal. You had, you had to be able to, to respond to an attack. Uh, in places where uh, maybe the, the closest hospital was uh, 20 minutes away or two hours away. That's, that's a huge responsibility. So, I mean, you are basically like a small alpha team. I mean, it, it's, it's a really cool situation to be in at someone at that age. And all of a sudden you have this responsibility or you're, you're floating around the world um, doing important work. And, you know, back then the, the CIA really was in the shadows I mean, I don't think we really saw what was going on until post 9-11 when you saw, you know, Jawbreaker and, and Johnny Michael Spann and everything about the real on the ground, boots on the ground CIA. Yes, that, you are correct. It was, um, it was a lot of responsibility. And then back then we were working with, um, we were struggling to, to, work, to, to figure out how to do this in a really dangerous environment. We had, we had to start getting armored cars into play. Uh, GPS were just three letters in the alphabet. They didn't exist. Didn't <laughs> exist back then. You I remember were using the, paper maps, or uh, or you just had to learn your way. Yeah, you remember uh, when the the pluggers first came out? 
<laughs> oh, and people are like, what is this thing? And like, <laughs> you know, you have to hit the one and the star and this, and it's like, oh my gosh. It was like, <laughs> and there's no Thomas guides in Somalia. So oh, <laughs> I no. can only imagine. If you lost your way off the main drags, you were lost. And um, that was one of the, the real uh, dangers. And it actually was one of the, uh, the problems that the, uh, the uh, Delta Force and, and the Rangers uh, ended up having in, in Mogadishu during the, the, the battle. They, they, uh, they couldn't keep track of where they were going when they got off the, to these side streets and they got lost. It's just an uh, amazing world, you know. These are the things you don't really think about. You know, because, you know, let's say you're not military, you're not law enforcement, you're not anything. And you're just like, there are so much logistics to just go right, like moving two miles up the road. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the um, trying to operate in these environments um, it took a lot of, uh, of uh, administrative support. And that's one thing that we, we had to gear up for, because as you look uh, in the, uh, back over the last uh, 20 years, We've been operating in these uh, war zones or what we call low intensity conflicts, Bosnia, Haiti, um, uh, places in the, in yeah. the Philippines. Um, so we've we've had to learn to to get in there quick. Yeah, and that's a lot of people forget about the Bosnias are still going on. Um, the Philippines is it's an absolute mess of, of just yes. you know <laughs> oof, that's a mess. Southern Philippines have been. <laughs> Uh, that's been one uh, one big show for a long time. I know. I spent a lot of time man. down there. I'm sure, because that's the thing. Is like I'm looking at your career went from 1989 to 2013. That is a long career to be, you know, kind of running and yeah, running every and major gunning. war zone since from '93 on. I hit it. Wow. Yeah. So you wrote a book, yes. which is cool. Because I mean, I you know that's one thing I did as soon as uh. As soon as I sat down, I said, you know what? I need to write a book. So I wrote about my time working the border and the cartel stuff and, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah. these, you know, people, I keep bringing this up. I keep dating myself every time I have a podcast now. And I'm like, you know, it, it comes down to books. People really like books now. Yes. And back in the day, all it was was books. You, you had to go to the library to get the information. But people, you know, they want a real book. And this book is 24 years of like the real CIA clandestine type stuff, the real 13 hours protective. I mean, yep. and that's, that's the one thing I want to jump. Well, you know, and that's the thing is you kind of brought up in the beginning was like, Hey, you know what? This was an ad in the paper. There really wasn't many of us out there. Now I imagine that the agency eventually does go to like the contracted work. That was in uh, 2001. After yeah. you know, after nine eleven, prior to that, it was all staff. And yeah. uh, this one of the reasons I wrote the book was the the uh, the thirteen hour story kind of just scratched the surface, but they alluded to uh, that this unit had really started in um, after nine eleven. And no, it actually started in uh, nineteen. Uh, basically, the, the the origin is nineteen ninety. The first official uh, training class was uh, nineteen ninety one. So there was a long history of doing this work without anybody knowing about it. You know what, though? That is one thing I've recognized, too, is that, you know, the air marshals used to be a very, very small unit. Um, the Border Patrol was actually very small pre, uh, pre-90s. pre And then uh, I was a customs special agent back in the day, and that was a smaller cadre. A lot of people don't realize that post-9-11, there was such a massive influx of every agency that you needed to. Yes. People forget that the origins were very, very Spartan. Yes. And that, that includes the equipment and training. We had, to, <laughs> yeah. we, and we had to learn to, to just uh, make do with what we had. I mean, in Somalia, we, we didn't have, um, we didn't have sufficient armor. So we got some armor plating from a helicopter. We, and we jury rigged the vehicle. And um, in other places, we had to do a lot of the same stuff, and we had to adjust. Yeah, and, it, and that's like the the uh, you know when Iraq started kicking off, people were um, removing the doors on the vehicles in order to you know run and gun, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden IEDs and they started to do makeshift armor. Oh, it, yeah. And now we're I mean we're going in like twenty years of of war fighting. 
you know. Yeah, with a lot of a lot of adjusting to the uh, the, the tactics of the the enemy uh, has forced us to to change our tactics. I was in I was posted to Iraq from uh, 2004 to 2005, and and that was when we closed Road Irish because of the dangers. It was the most dangerous road in the world. The, it's a road from the uh, the uh, mm-hmm. airport to the to the main city of Baghdad. And yeah, I must have just missed you because uh, I was up in Balad in '06. Ah, okay. <laughs> I, I hit everywhere up there. I'm I sure, man. I'm and, sure. Yeah, um, but it was it was those were some crazy days because we had to uh, started out with small arms fire, so then we armored up and we mm-hmm. started using um, uh, artillery shells planted in the road. Uh, or along the sides of the road, so we started to uh, we cleared all that out of the way, uh, so it was no nothing along the roads, and then we started doing patrols, and then they started bringing vehicles onto the road and basically uh, hitting us with uh, what well, we used to call yeah. car bombs, but now they call it V B I E D V B I E D. I know, man. <laughs> Alphabet soup. Ah, uh, so I mean, what is your? I mean, how do you deal with you know what? I, I kind of wanted to jump into this later on in the conversation, but we'll jump into it now. I mean, cause you, you, you have a life on the line. Your life is literally on the line. Um, mm-hmm. How do you deal with the stress? I mean, this is 20 something years of a stressful environment. Yeah. yeah moving around a lot. I, I, I was undercover for 23 out of 24 years. So I lied about where I, what I did. And, um, I had to, uh, I, I did a lot of lying to family about where I was going <laughs> and, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of stress for, for me. It was, it was a lot of, uh, like working out and, um, I, I used to do, uh, I used to coach wrestling. So I, I got into some of the martial arts and, um, I took a lot of trips, uh, like personal uh, vacation trips to visit um, family members that I, I had working out in Asia. So I would go out there and it was a way to just uh, uh, get rid of the stress and then come back to work. And uh, I spent so much time on the road. I, uh, out of the 24 years I worked at, at the agency, the longest time I ever spent in one place was the three years that I was posted to Asia. Oh man. What, what years were you in Asia? 2001 to 2004. Oh, very cool. And during, you know, during that long stretch, yeah. Where was that at? That uh, was based um, our uh, Philippines and Thailand. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, great diving, great people, oh, that's great really food. Cool. So, yeah. <laughs> great but you, food. you brought up a good point. Uh, one of the things I wanted to do in, in my book is, is, is kind of peel back and do the origin story of the, of the 13 Hours group, the, the POC slash GRS, Global Response Staff. But the other part was, and then, and then also to kind of give the readers a chance to experience what it was like to do low profile protection, um, mm-hmm. which is a little different animal than, you know, Secret Service or the big State Department mounted up Suburbans. And then um, the other part was the human toll. Because we have people working 24-7, 365 in places all over the world where they, even the military doesn't go. And, yeah. Um, that's and that's the thing is like so you know you're moving a convoy out of the gate you're moving a convoy of like you know tons of vehicle but you know you guys are just rolling really light i mean how do you really like you know later on we're, we're talking like and, in the few uh, thousands <laughs> what do you what kind of like you know it's not like you're going to get a rapid qrf or anything but what are you rolling with as far as gear uh, well, you, you thousands of rounds of ammo. Yeah. Just. Well, see, that's the thing. You're the, the real theory is you don't get into a gunfight because they're always going to outnumber you. Yeah. Especially when you're vehicles <laughs> <laughs> and and you're right and they're sedans and <laughs> but see that's where stealth and speed become your your allies. If they look at you and you go, who is that? Oh, well, by the time they they start thinking, you're already gone. Um, and changing routes, changing your look, um, dressing local, um, mm-hmm. anything to c- confuse them so that they don't um, think you're a viable target. And it's worked. I'm, uh, I mean, it, this unit is incredibly successful considering all the war zones we were in and, all, uh, and the fact that some places there was zero QRF. Um, and we basically we've never lost a protectee doing our primary mission. Huh. We only lost one officer in uh, 
and that's that's a pretty pretty good record. Uh, now, you know, lost some do when they were doing secondary missions like Static, mm-hmm. like in Benghazi, and and uh, when they were uh, at the Annex or uh, Coast, when uh, when that uh, individual um, uh, the suicide. Yeah. Bomb but doing the doing the, our main mission, we've uh, been very very successful. Now you mentioned thirteen hours, and it's 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 very interesting. One of my guests this week was a uh, Max Martini, who played one of the guys in Thirteen Hours. Mm-hmm. And I think the movie, you know, what do you think about the movie? Not to throw you in the spot. But. Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, it's it's well, Hollywood. It's the movie. It's yeah. Hollywood. It's Hollywood. Yeah. Um, but uh, the there there's a some of the you know the action scenes they're trying to 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 really show the chaos of the moment and it's almost impossible to do that even with movie with hollywood um you i'll give you exa- a little bit of a, of a of a mindset thing you're you're going into the dark even though you may know the location you have no idea who's who's also coming to the party so um the guys could have run into you know, 50, a hundred bad guys. They could have run into 50 or a hundred good guys, but in the, but in the darkness, you don't know who's who. Um, the chaos of those moments is hard to describe, you know, in a, even in a moving setting. So it's, um, you know, the, the, I give those guys tons of credit for, for mounting up and, and, and going in. But that's hey, part of the job. No, no, you don't know if it's going to be like a suicide mission or not. Correct. Especially Correct. when you know you're, you know, a handful of people out in the middle of a, a country with with no backup. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and you know you're there. I mean, you you know your circumstances, and this and we've been in there. This is where where people don't understand that the State Department has done this many many times. They put mm-hmm. people at risk many many places. And most of the time, they roll the dice and they win. But in this case, they did. Uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> I listen to these stories on my podcast and everywhere else. I'm just like, it, it's so frustrating, you know. It, I can, and I can only imagine being in the arena like yourself. Yeah, the the, the rising up to the ranks where I, I I ended up being the head of security in Iraq for all of our operations, and then. Then out in the, in the Pakistan Afghan uh, theater, it's uh, I mean you're responsible for every single agency person on the ground, contractor and staff, and you've got to be able to account for them at any moment, and um, every operation, every activity has to be looked at through the prism of, of security, and it is if you if you take your job seriously, it is it's a hell of a, a weight to carry, and you know all the security uh, personnel. Uh, you know, being ready to go at a moment's notice, and um, and everybody's watching you, even though they, they they may not you know look at you directly, but they're watching how you're reacting to uh, news of, of a car bombing attack at one of the bases or um, uh, blue on green. So there's a situation where local local shoot up, um, you know, their trainers. It's it's a very tense situation. And, Everything is has a security aspect of about it. Everything. Everything. I mean, there was a, a, an SF guy when I was over there that just going to the latrine, he got electrocuted. It's little yeah. things. I mean, there's so much avenues that, you know. Yeah, there's are, no OSHA out there. No. Are there <laughs> Those trailers are <laughs> yes. not always the best. There was quite, oh, it's there horrible. quite a few places where there were the, le- the electrical conditions were bad. I mean, when we were moving into the... Um, into Saddam's palace that later became the embassy, they would send the, the, the Iraqi uh, electricians up into the ceilings to, to oh, run the wiring. And we lost, while I was there, we lost at least three of them. Well, the other thing too is the Iraqis, like, you know, set in mortar positions, <laughs> oh. coordinates while they're working for you. How do you vet those people? Oh my gosh. It's, that's the hard part was when you don't, you don't know the enemy. You don't know who they are because they're not wearing a uniform. And um, one minute they're they're working for you, uh, next minute they're working against you. I almost feel like we forgot Vietnam. <laughs> you know, oh. there's so many lessons learned in Vietnam about you know counterinsurgency and everything. And then, you know, forty, fifty years later, you know, you're dealing with the same type of booby traps and just craziness. 
But that's that's a podcast for all. That's a, a <laughs> book right there. <laughs> now, besides Asia, let's change the topic a little bit. Sure. Let's get a little positive. This is the protectors. Mm-hmm. We have inspiration. <laughs> because, man, you guys have some great stories, man. It's not just guys. It's guys and girls and everybody that's, like, putting their life on the line. I don't think yeah. I've had one guest yet who hasn't had, like, just the story. Yeah, but there's, there's yeah. tons of stories. I'll, I'll tell you a lighthearted one. I, um, in That's where I'm getting Iraq, at. Give me a yeah. lighthearted one. <laughs> in Iraq, it wasn't all doom and gloom. We, um, the agency is, uh, uh, and that's what we call ourselves. We don't call ourselves a company. That was an old term. The agency yeah. um, is almost always wet. That means we're always, we have always have alcohol. And uh, we usually have a bar. And at one point uh, during that 04, 05 time period, there were, we were uh, like the only bar with one exception in the area. And so it was a great way to, uh, to get things done business wise, because you could invite people to the bar and everybody wanted to go to the CIA bar. And um, uh, now as the head of security, I, you know, I was the senior bouncer. So I had to deal with all the security <laughs> issues that go with that. And, um, we had a, a party night on Thursday night and they had a little disco ball in there and there was dancing and it was, uh, it was a, it was a great place to, uh, let off a little steam and forget for a moment where you are. And, um, a lot of different people from different government, uh, uh, agencies and even, um, some, some of the foreign military elements would, would get together there and, and actually, um, get to know each other and, um, and good business was done. So crazy days at the bar. Now there was another bar nearby. I said, you know, one exception, but that was like a star Wars bar. It was, it was run by, <laughs> it was in the compound of a South African demining company. Oh my God. Okay. And the stories I heard, I never went in there, but the stories I heard were they, they rolled, they swept up the eyeballs in the morning. It was rough. Uh, so I, I didn't want any of my people going into there. <laughs> That's that's one of the security aspects nobody ever talks about. Keep your people away from the uh, Star Wars bars in third world countries. And don't drive while you're drinking and yes. uh, carrying a gun. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah, I'd always make sure that they were people coming in the bars were disarmed before they came in. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, besides Asia, what was your favorite post? I... I enjoyed work in South America. I, uh, for three years, I trained presidential level uh, protection details for foreign governments. So uh, I worked with uh, the Bolivians, the Colombians, the Panamanians. Panamanians didn't like us much. I think they still remembered um, when we came in. There. Oh, yeah. <laughs> got rid of uh, <laughs> <laughs> their cash cow. Their, yeah, they didn't like that much. But I worked with a lot of great people. And these were... Uh, uh, people who are trying to, to keep their leaders safe. And um, so we would come in and they would be so happy to see us. And uh, they'd be basically crying at the airport when we left because we were giving them good training and equipment and, um, and uh, well, it was a yeah. real positive environment. So, and, and those places were relatively um, safe, except for Columbia. <laughs> Columbia was get, getting blown up a little bit from um, the cartel. What year was that? That was uh, 94. Oh yeah. 95, 96. That was the age of the powder, yeah. you know, like, yeah. like so the post, was, the, the post Miami and they started moving the corridors up to, uh, up through Mexico then. So yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, and uh, they were, they, they were blowing up the city. I mean, it was a major battle between the, um, the, the Colombian government and the cartels. Yeah. So I never really got a, a chance to go out of, uh, out of Bogota. What a crazy life, man. I love it. Uh, your book is available everywhere now, right? Yeah, on Barnes & Noble and Amazon. Um, and we're doing, a, we're doing a, a book signing at the famous Poison Pen um, on the 3rd of September. That's in, uh, that's in uh, Arizona, Scottsdale, oh, Arizona. Cool. Yeah. Now, you, are, you, um, are you out here in D.C. by me? No, I'm actually back in my hometown, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, where I was born and raised. Uh, the grandson of a Titanic survivor. Wow. Yes. That is very cool. Yeah, uh, I think some luck runs in the family. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> That's you how know, I made it out of that career without any extra holes. <laughs> exactly. It must be part of the blood, the DNA. 
Mm-hmm. And all I could think of was cold because I went to college in Minnesota after I got out of the army. Oh, oh my gosh, it's so cold out there. Minnesota. It's probably snowing. Uh, it probably <laughs> snowed last week, didn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. Now, do you plan on doing any more book signings? Uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm working on uh, doing one out in D.C. I'm hoping to do it at the Spy Museum. Oh, that'd be awesome. And Count me in. another one. Oh, great. I'll, ke- I'll keep you in the loop. And uh, that one we're looking forward to because that, that'll fit. I'm actually doing it in collaboration with uh, two other gentlemen. Um, uh, Dave Austin, who wrote a book called, called uh, um, uh, Tehran, Tehran Vengeance. And uh, another CIA, that was a, that's a fiction book. And then uh, another CIA um, officer who uh, actually was on the director's protection staff and then left to do high net worth protection in the private sector. And his name is Mike Trott, and his book is called hmm. the, the Protectors. So oh, The Protectors. Kind of a, there we go. I like it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's kind of a theme. <laughs> it is. Have you been on a Spycast yet, the podcast? No, I have not. Yeah, that's a, that's a pretty that. good one. That's a really good one. I like that. I'd love to see you on there. Yeah, I did uh, soft uh, soft rep radio twice. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, really cool. And they're they're a great bunch. Yeah, got to get you get you on the uh, network now. All the uh, the podcasts and everything. Because mm-hmm. that's one thing about the Protectors podcast. I don't make a dime, and I'm just here to help everybody that's a guest. <laughs> oh, we appreciate that. And hey, now, of, oh, go ahead. I was, I was going to say, uh, make a plug. Uh, um, you know, we talk about the career and, and um, you know, I feel very fortunate that I made it through my 24 without any mm-hmm. uh, mishaps, but that doesn't always uh, work out for some. And, and some of our uh, officers have, have perished in, in the line of duty. And um, at the CIA, there, we, have a, we have a charity called the CIA Officer Memorial Foundation. And it's specifically to um, help uh, families of slain officers. So um, I'm, I'm giving 10% of my profits for my book uh, directly to that uh, charity because um, uh, I've, I've seen the effect on, on our, on our family members when, when we lose, when we lose an officer. Yeah. That's what we were talking about before we started the podcast was about, you know, the charities for, for these types of uh, everybody I, ha- I talk to has a, a different charity and it's kind of it's it really sucks that we have to have charities because there's so many people that have lost their life in the line of duty. And man, I really appreciate you pushing that out there. And we're gonna and I'm gonna add links to everything. Um, where else can we find you? Are you on uh, any of the social media platforms? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'm all over LinkedIn, um, and I do. I have a, a Guardian um, Facebook page. And I'm also guardian um, uh, underscore um, novel on Instagram where uh, I put some photos of like some of the events. I, I just attended uh, Thriller Fest, which is a, uh, a, a thriller writers convention in New York. And I'll be uh, posting things from, from the uh, book signing in uh, Arizona. And then I put some other photos. I also have a, uh, a YouTube video where um, I, I have actual pictures from the book, but they're in color and then a few other extra pictures. So for people who may be interested in taking a look at some stuff before they buy the book, that's a great way to do it. Or go on to LinkedIn. I did um, sneak peeks of my book. Uh, I, don't, I think I did uh, like 12 or 13 little excerpts from the book to give people an idea of what, what the book was like. Yeah, I'm definitely going to check that out. Um, I like the YouTube platform. And, you know, I really like LinkedIn now as far as because you're getting away from, oh, yeah. you know, uh, Twitter is just so drama filled. Instagram is awesome. And uh, mm-hmm. I really like LinkedIn when it comes down to just being able to get some stories out there quick and kind of, especially when it comes to, you know, professionals that want to read a decent book. Absolutely. It, uh, that's uh, that's one. That's how I found you. <laughs> exactly. You were, you were a lot of people were talking about on, on LinkedIn about your podcast, so I had to tune in. <laughs> wow, this is great. It's the protectors, man. Everybody talks about the protectors. No, I'm just kidding. I love it. This is like the, my second career once I get done with the government is going to be uh, gonna be just kind of doing this stuff. But, Thomas, I really appreciate you coming on. Anything else you want to plug out before we go? No, that's got it. got your uh, book. We got social media. We got a signing. We're going to get you on SpyCast. That's, that's the goal, <laughs> but uh, that would be great. 
Awesome. And I'll keep you in the loop on, uh, on when we get the spy museum. Yes, uh, book signing, definitely. Cause I'll be back in DC for that. Very cool. I'm over here by Tyson. So if you come over, do some agency stuff uh, up this way. He's, he used to live near there. <laughs> I'm that sure you did. I was all right at Tyson's <laughs> <laughs> when I was home. Oh, that's great. Hey, thanks a lot for coming on. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate that.